What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I wanted to explore an interesting little topic here, um, which is the 10 most underrated beer styles. I'm hoping this video kind of gives an idea to brewers who are kind of stuck in not sure what they want to brew next. What I've come up with is a list of 10 beer styles that are not super popular, you don't see them all the time, but are absolutely worth brewing, are very delicious beers, and a really fun experience. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. Number one is bitter, the English bitter style. Um, this is an absolutely amazing type of beer. I personally have not seen it outside of the UK, outside of the style of ESB or extra special bitter. Within the category of bitters themselves, there's ordinary bitters, there's special bitters, there's extra special bitters and best bitters. Um, and each of these have different levels of alcohol in them, different colors, different uh, malt bills and stuff. They're really quite exciting especially when they're on cask or paired with a traditional low level of carbonation um, you would have with an English style, they are absolutely amazing and well worth brewing. In classic English fashion, it's not actually really a bitter beer at all. It's quite the opposite. It's uh, malty, rich toffee flavors, a little bit of breadiness, but you do get a good amount of English hop character. Usually East Kent Goldings or Fuggles are the uh, hops of choice, and there's a lot added in the late boil. They're quite delicious and well worth brewing. The second underrated beer on my list is Dunkelweizen. Um, you never see these either. You see Hefeweizen all the time, and it's a very popular beer, not only to brew, but also to just buy and consume. Um, but Dunkelweizen is not really often seen. Dunkelweizen being the dark version of a Hefeweizen. If you were to take the delicious flavors of a Munich Dunkel and blend that with a Hefeweizen, it's a very easy beer to brew. It is absolutely worth it, and you get so much flavor out of it. They tend to be bready um, and have like a little bit of a raisin character, sometimes like a toffee, uh, fruitcake kind of figgy character. Um, but also on top of that, you get like little bits of chocolate, and then pairing all of that with the banana and clove character of Hefeweizen yeast, add to that the smooth and full-bodied character of a Weiss beer, and it's a really special thing. Next one on the list is another German beer, Alt beer. So Alt beer is another one I talked about recently. Alt beer is a hybrid beer. It's made with a, a German ale or Kolsch style yeast. It's like the cousin of Kolsch, but you see Kolsch a lot more frequently outside because it's a pale beer. And I think pale beers are far more popular. So an Alt beer is a darker beer. It's a lot more bitter and hoppy than, uh, than a Kolsch is. It's actually one of the most hoppy German beers out there. And because of that, it's a great showcase for noble hops and what they can do in higher quantities. And pairing that with a delicious dark lager-like base, but fermented with a uh, German ale yeast, you get these nice esters on top of it, and it's a really, really nice experience. Um, an alt beer is something I have not made in many, many years, but it's something that is on my short list of uh, rebrews because it is so tasty. The next one is Belgian Pale Ale. I feel like when it comes to Belgian ales, the Trappist beers really end up stealing the show for everybody else. But there's a lot more Belgian beers out there. And uh, beyond just the very strong ones, there's also not so strong ones. There's much, much lighter styles. One of those specifically being Belgian Pale Ale. Belgian Pale Ale has subdued esters relative to the Trappists. Um, it has a lot more malt character actually, and is a nice showcase for some gentle hopping. Uh, and it's a really delicious style. Oftentimes they're amber colored and oftentimes they're relatively low strength, I mean, four to 5% ABV. They're actually a perfect choice to enjoy with a meal and they don't necessarily have the massive alcohol kick that most of the other Belgian beers have. It's a really nice alternative to some of the stronger Belgian styles and uh, definitely one of my favorites. The next underrated style is Czech Dark Lager. So out of all the Czech lagers, I think the Czech dark lager is probably the most interesting one. I found them on tap a few times in a few locations, and when they were on tap, they were absolutely amazing. And when that is paired with a side pull, it is an absolutely amazing beer. They're often overshadowed though by Czech Pilsners, which is undoubtedly the more popular type of Czech beer. Um, there's also the Czech Amber Lager out there, and it kind of has an honorable mention as well, because I've never seen that on tap, but I've also never actually tasted one. You have that soft Czech water, and then you add to that some soft roasted notes that are kind of like a hint in the background. You get this jet black beer um, that is totally clear, but it doesn't have strong bitter roasted notes. It's very similar, in fact, to a Schwartz beer. However, Schwartz beers that I've had are actually a lot more uh, intense in flavor than Czech Dark Lager. The Czech Dark Lagers I've had have been very, very light 
easy drinking, highly palatable beers with a lot of that malt complexity that you're looking for. And to top it off, you have that Czech yeast on top of everything that's so different than uh, German yeasts. So it's distinguished easily from a Schwartz beer in my tasting experience, and it's an absolutely delicious option. I'm hoping to brew a Czech dark lager relatively soon, so um, hopefully I can share with you guys the actual experience. The next one on the list is Cream Ale. Cream Ale is a delicious, underrated American style of beer. I think it's overshadowed by pale lagers, blonde ales, and pale ales. Of course, all of the hoppy offerings of American beer are gonna overshadow it, but it's somewhere between like a Mexican lager and a lighter uh, American pale lager. That being said, it's an ale. It's easier to brew. It's got nice esters on top of it, and oftentimes it's made with a high percentage of corn, which gives you this kind of sweet puffed corn character. I just made one of these, and it was one of my favorite beers I've had in a while. Um, it's a great showcase for classic American hops as well, so definitely worth checking out cream ales when you can find them. Another American style that's well worth mentioning for this list that I've seen on tap only one time is pre-prohibition lager. Um, technically, Yangling traditional lager is a pre-prohibition lager, but I've never actually had one called out as a pre-prohibition lager outside of Rising Tide Brewing in Portland, Maine. This is a truly unique beer. Pre-prohibition lagers are adjunct lagers that are brewed, um, they were brewed by European immigrants that came to the United States before prohibition. And using the European brewing methods that they knew, they used American ingredients like six row barley malt, corn, and American hops, and created some really phenomenal beers. Uh, as a result of that, they were quite unique from what they would make in Europe. Pre-prohibition lagers are definitely a bit cornier, but they're also a lot maltier than some of the European uh, cousins. And also there's sometimes a little bit of like a cool little peppery note on top of it all that can come from certain yeast strains. In the same vein as cream ale, adding in American hops, some of the classic ones like the original American Hallertau derivatives are really amazing. I do highly recommend checking out pre-prohibition lagers when you get a chance. The next one is the English Porter. You'll oftentimes find American porters pretty much anywhere, but finding a true English porter is actually really difficult. Um, obviously in the UK you can find them, but not here in America. The porters we have here in America are usually like six to seven percent ABV. They're really roasty and robust and have a lot of hops in them as well. Whereas the English versions of them are much, much lower in alcohol, have a lot less roasted character sometimes, a lot sweeter, have maltier roundness to them and are made with English hops and English yeasts and these really are some special beers. It's been a very long time since I've actually had a true English porter, uh, but if you can find it, it's well worth getting. Uh, it's just one of those things that you have to try, especially if you're a beer nerd, so check them out when you can. The next one out there is American Amber Ale. So you don't really find that many American Amber Ales out there, and kind of on the same vein, American Brown Ales either. Um, but these are two classic American beer styles that are so so delicious. American Amber Ale is gonna be amber in color, and it has a lot of nice, usually West Coast style hops in it. Depending on the variety of hops used, it can be fruity, it can be tropical, it can be piney, it can be dank. You're usually gonna have those American style hops in it though, with American yeast and American malts. They can be relatively light in alcohol or relatively robust, depending on what you want out of them. Um, there's a wide range for them. Oftentimes, American Amber Ale is just like that beer that hits the sweet spot. It's just hoppy enough, it's just malty enough, it's just interesting enough, pretty enough. Um, it just hits that spot almost every single time. It's almost a perfect jack of all trades beer, and it's kind of hard to find people that don't really like them. But for some reason, they're just really not all that popular. I think they're just overshadowed by IPAs and lighter beers. The next one is Doppelbach. Um, so Doppelbach is an underrated style that I never see anywhere. Outside of traditional German lager breweries or places that are like fully dedicated to German beers or German lagers, those are the only times that I've ever seen Doppelbach. It's not like your average brewery down the street is gonna be making a Doppelbach. I mean, the reason for this is because Doppelbachs are incredibly difficult beers to make, um, and they take a very long time to mature and brew, uh, to be honest. If you find a brewery that is doing a decoction mash and lagering a Doppelbach for six months, um, it's probably worth trying. Odds are a ton of time, pain, and effort has gone into making that Doppelbach, and you'd better hope it's a good one. 
Doppelbox probably have the most flavor of any German lager, and the reason for that is the strength and is the sheer amount of malt used. Um, they're very complicated. They oftentimes are made with the decoction, which causes that rich melanoidin character. They're usually coming in somewhere between 6 and 9% alcohol, depending on what kind of Doppelbock you're getting. Sometimes we'll see them made into Eisbox as well, which will crank the alcohol up even further. Um, all in all though, Doppelbox are on that list because I never see them and because they are so, so good. Um, it's probably one of the most difficult beers to undertake as a home brewer as well, but definitely well worth it if you have the time. Um, these are one of those beers that still, regardless of whatever quick lager method you want to use, still need a long time to let the flavors round out and to let the alcohol smooth itself out as well. So it's kind of one of those lagers that you can't get around the aging period on. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and it gave you some inspiration to try out some new beer styles that you might not have tried out before. But trust me on this, it's well worth doing. Um, these are some of my favorite beers of all time and I do think that they're really criminally underbrewed. Now, the list of underrated beer styles is definitely not contained to just 10, so let me know down in the comments what you think are the other underrated beer styles that also should be explored. If you don't mind, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I do a lot more brewing videos than I do talking videos, but I think there's value in both. If you want to support the channel, please go ahead and check out my merchandise store. You can get this t-shirt as well as many others like it down in the description box. I also have a Patreon and my Patreon supporters really have been helping me make a huge upgrade to my production quality on this channel and things are really changing for the better. So a very big, very deliberate shout out and thank you to my Patreon supporters. I also have a channel membership option if you want to check that out for some more ways to support me. And um, there's the super thanks button as well if you feel inclined to hit that. All of those things mean a lot to me. I really do appreciate it and it goes back into the channel. I also have an Amazon store down in the description box where you can find uh, the YouTube gear that I use and most of the brewing gear that I can stand behind and thoroughly recommend. So check that out if you're curious. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check those out for some more frequent content updates in between videos. And last but certainly not least, if you are still here, thank you very, very much for being here. It means a lot to me. And this is an 8% Belgian Golden Strong Ale, so uh, I'm not gonna chug it, but you do have my thanks, and I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.